Hello, I'm Sarah Spiteri, and you're listening to The Well-Crafted Life, the new podcast from Homes and Gardens that considers one big question. How do we enhance our homes? And so, our lives. Every week, I'll be asking three tastemakers to share three secrets. It's a podcast that focuses as much on the little things as the big things, because a well-crafted life is made up of both. I hope you enjoy the show. This episode of The Well-Crafted Life is sponsored by Martin Moore, Classic English Kitchens. This week's theme is bold, bright and beautiful, and my three guests are all champions of colour and use it to transform interiors. The show opens with Trisha Guild, who has been filling our homes with upbeat shades and lively patterns since 1970 when she founded Designers Guild. My second guest is textiles and interior designer Eva Sonica. She is best known for creating standout accessories inspired by her heritage. Finally, we'll hear from colour curator Joa Studham, the creative mind behind the Farron Ball paint palette. It's a packed episode that spans from travel diaries and design heroes all the way to fresh air and family photos. I'm delighted to welcome my first guest, Trisha Guild. Hi, Trisha. It's lovely to have you on The Well-Crafted Life. Hello, Sarah. Lovely to be with you. I'm asking all my guests to kick off with a description of their home. I, kn- I know yours is a trove of uplifting colour and pattern, but tell us all about it. Well, it's a traditional sort of late Victorian house. It's four stories, but inside it is quite contemporary. And what I loved about the space when I saw it is that it had actually all been ripped apart. So I didn't have that nostalgic feeling, oh, I've got to keep those cornices or, you know, um, the skirtings, etc. So it's in West London. And being on a corner, there's quite a lot of light flowing in from different windows and different spaces. And that's really important. And I love that. Um, And when you come in, it, it sort of feels very contemporary. It's more like Um, an apartment on three floors or something because there is just one space Um, one space on the on the ground floor and one space on the lower ground floor which goes on to a terrace and so um, the light floods in and um, it is full of colour, full of, but then to me, colour is white as well and neutral colour, so we'll talk about that. It's full of all, everything that I'm working on because I am my work. What do you think it is about colour? You know, what, why have you over the years and over your career and your business been so drawn to colour? I just find it so energising, and especially now. So... Colour for me is like, you know, you wake up and and the day is set or what brings you some energy or what brings you harmony? And I'm always trying when I work with people to find out what is their sense of colour? What flowers do they love? What's their favourite painting? Something that one can pick up and say, actually, you really love living with those sort of warm shades or really love living with cooler shades, which I think is is how I am. I'm always looking for the landscape. Um, You know, my first memories of being in my grandfather's garden and him giving me a packet of seeds and and working in the garden with him. And so, you know, those colours of the sky or the particular shade of lilac from looking at a wisteria. Um, It's interesting, the power of memory in that respect as well. I think, you know, how we look to our kind of references and that's a very personal thing. Yes, it is. And I think we all have them. We've just got to find them and actually not be fearsome of them. Yeah. Because there's so much fear in selecting for one's home and, and it's a shame because there's so much energy that you can bring on a daily basis. And I think right now that's so important. Now, tell me about your first visit to Japan. That's your first secret for us. So tell us yeah. about that. Do you know, it came out of a time when I was, um, I think I was not becoming quite nostalgic in, in my choices of things. And I went to Japan and I suddenly felt this kind of inner discipline that they, um, that, that's in their spirit, the way they use things. I, I, it, 
kind of changed. I think I became much more contemporary after my first visit to Japan. I appreciated more what they were doing and thought, yes, that that is maybe a more minimal way of, say, looking at one space or looking at, you know, do I have to have great big bunches of flowers? No, I could have maybe one or two or three. I think it just kind of changed something in, in that way in me. And that's what I love about traveling. I mean, my first trip to India, I will, it's, it's in my heart, it's in my soul. And I think it, it gave me a kind of recognition of something inside me that maybe understood color in my way. You know, I'm not saying I understand color in everybody's way. I agree when you when you go to, well, a sensory country like India um, and Japan, but, you know, you, it is sort of transformative and you do see things in a new way that you don't perhaps get in a, in a grayer cityscape where we both live. Um, you know, that kind of travel can be so invigorating. Well, I think... You know, I'm so lucky because my work has led me to do that. I would never have made all those, been able to make all those trips. So, yes, and it's it's a constant um, inspiration, actually. And who who or what in the design world is inspiring you at the moment? I suppose I've always looked at, at art of artists. Um, you know, I'm very um, very inspired by Howard Hodgkin, um, which. Who, and the first time I met Howard, I went into his studio and there was just one painting on the wall. He always turned everything around. And I just, I was so inspired by that. And I've always had that feeling for his work. Um, also, he is greatly inspired by India. I mean, that's very much um, his language in his own way. So I'm... And, you know, fortunately, I I have some of his work. I have some of his fabric. So, you know, that is a constant. Um, I look at architecture. Um, you know, I've always been very involved in the visual arts, and I miss terribly going to the opera and theatre because I think that's a place where designers can be so uh, free. I agree. It's, it takes designing spaces to another level. So, you know, one can be listening to an opera or listening to Philip Glass, quite different maybe from uh, Verdi or Wagner, but you know, all creating these different um, feelings. And I think that's also very important to bring that in into one's space as well. You know, I use candles a lot, scented candles or, you know, little night lights, not just at night, but it sort of brings a sense of um, welcome. And yeah, that's your second secret, actually, isn't it? Bringing a sense of welcome or well-being. Yeah, I think that's really important because we're all searching for that. It's on our minds all the time now in a way that you know, we didn't have that before because before we thought everything was how we planned it and now we can't plan anything. <laughs> and that is a huge emotional change. Um, so, but I have always thought flowers, but I'm not talking about spending fortunes here. I go into the garden and, you know, in the summer I've got, scented geraniums and I'm keeping those leaves going now just a couple of leaves or you know one bunch of narcissi and suddenly there's a scent of of those beautiful spring flowers I'm not I'm not saying that this is a luxurious thing it is about care and thought um so you know a scented candle some beautiful leaves um Suddenly you come into a space and it feels alive and it feels welcome. And it's an effort, you know, and I think that, I mean, in a way it's cooking from proper ingredients. I've always done that. And I think that, um, and I always lay the table properly. I think all of those things are really important. And I think it, it, um, it can bring a sense of occasion. You know, a meal to me is a sense of occasion. Yeah, I agree. No. You mentioned in the description of your home white, and I have. I would like to talk to you about, you know, how you use white and also planes. Okay, well, white is a colour. Um, 
it's it's a I mean it's such a beautiful pure color. So I am very happy doing a whole white space for somebody. Um, but which shade of white? You know, we have about eight different shades of white because white can clash. I mean, how many white fabrics do we have? Linen, velvet, silk. Um, you know, wool, all these different shades, they have to be thought about, same as sort of off-white or magnolia or ecru or green. But they're colors that kind of give a sense of harmony as well. I'm using sort of cool colors, so I'm using um, Cornish ware and cloudless, which are different shades of blue. And so I like alabaster or I also use whitewash. Those are the two coolest whites that I've got. It's been a core part of my ethos for, oh, I don't know, you know, many, many years. In the beginning, you know, I had very limited funds. <laughs> so and the collection came from 20 fabrics <laughs> and, and they happened to be these small village prints. So I think, you know, one and, and the tagline that it was always decorative and maybe floral has stayed. And of course, that's also part of my vocabulary that I absolutely love. But 60% of what I do is plain, you know, and we all need those. I like shaded cloths as well, or different kinds of plain fabrics, different textures. It's all very, very important. You mentioned as your third secret, um, a love of Juliet Glaives in particular. Juliet is a very special person. She grows all her flowers. I mean, you know, she is so talented and the way she feels about flowers is, is the way I f feel about it. You know, she is in the landscape and it's, it's such a tremendous effort that you kind of feel it from just looking at her flowers and looking at her Instagram. And we're very lucky because um, when she's got flowers – she brings them to Designers Guild and we sell them or she sells them from our little courtyard and she'll make, you know, our Christmas wreaths and things like that. So it's a real collaboration. I love that. I love collaborating with people of like minds. But actually, you know, if you look at her Instagram, all of those flowers that you see on there are from, from their fields, their fields of flowers. And I just know the effort in that. I'll also look at Arnie Maynard, Arnie Maynard, you know, landscape design. I mean, he's brilliant. I'll look at his Insta as well, because, oh my goodness, you know, that's fantastic. <laughs> so I can fill myself with those things that are nour nourishing. Yeah. Well, Tricia, thank you. You've given us so much decorating inspiration. You oh, thank you. Power of color and obviously the importance of people so it was a real joy talking to you so thank you so much i just want to interrupt to talk to you about martin moore specialists in bespoke kitchen furniture martin moore is known for classic english design with an elegant timeless style committed to excellence and british craftsmanship all their kitchens are custom designed and handmade to order in their uk workshops to find out about martin moore and their kitchens head to their website martinmoore.com or follow them on Instagram at martinmoordesign. My second guest is textile designer Eva Sonika. Welcome, Eva. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast, Sarah. Oh, we're delighted. Now, as you know, this, this, this week's theme is bold, bright and beautiful. And I can imagine your home is just that. Yes, my home is definitely bold, bright and beautiful. So I live in North London um, in a 1930s semi-detached house. And it's a bit of a story because we um, bought it, I think, about 13 years ago and went house hunting. And we're actually looking in West London. And I think the first house we looked at in North London is the house we live in today. And and we were literally, we came in and um, fell absolutely in love with the house, with the style, with everything. Um, we, it was a total project. It was a one and a half year project. So I designed or kind of, kind of sketched what I wanted. I'm not an architect and got an architectural company to come and they totally transformed it from a three bedroom kind of typical, you know, 1930s semi-detached into I would say our dream home. Um, we have like an open plan living downstairs um, and then three bedrooms on the first floor and a um, top floor with a big loft room. But I think what makes my house 
special to me at least is it really tells my personal story and my family's story i would say um as you may know i'm nigerian but i was born and raised in germany and um i was from a very very early age kind of exposed to two very very strong cultural influences with the kind of nigerian traditional yoruba um, you know clothing textile music cultural tradition uh, but also with german tradition my parents were very much into the arts my father was working in the arts as an art historian so we traveled a lot and i was exposed to german and, and kind of mid mid european um kind of art and, and 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 culture so i think that's all reflected in the house um and as you know i'm a sucker for color <laughs> I absolutely love color so color is everywhere so you have um traditional antique um german furniture mixed with uh colorful african art with um african statues so it's a whole mixture of of i think who i am and what my family is beautiful i mean we we talk a lot on this podcast um about the importance of memories and it sounds to me as though your home is infused with these these different backgrounds and i also can see that coming through in your work absolutely i think my work that that that's what makes my work i think unique um it's the the mixture of my my experiences and my my upbringing and i think the the mixture of the kind of african colors and patterns but then i think it's at the same time also very structured and very um classic and people say it's not typically african i mean it's always a question what is typically african but i think it's it's this this mixture of what what how i grew up and what i experienced is really reflected in my work and how do you find those references um have you traveled a lot back to nigeria to research those references yeah i go back every year and whenever i'm out there i think that's when i'm in my creative high that's when i am see that's when i sketch and when i take photographs it's not just this i think my memory just absorbs so much um when i'm when i'm out there and it's not just nigeria it's it's, it's i mean the whole of west africa even other parts of africa so we used to travel a lot and i feel positive that we will travel again <laughs> in, the, in the in the in the future I don't know when um but thank god these memories stay with you you know these that makes me think of um of your first secret that you've shared with me which um you've titled start each day fresh this is very much based on a on a memory yes i um i really start each day fresh um and i literally do that um as i air my house the whole house is aired and it comes from when i was a kid we had a housekeeper in germany and she was like a old school german <laughs> housekeeper she was my nanny for 15 years an amazing lady and she came in every morning the first thing she did she ate the whole house you know hanging the duvets everything out and you know the house was always smelling of fresh linen and it was just absolutely you know you, you even in winter when it's freezing cold the windows were open and fresh air came through the house and i um kind of adopted that um to my life my kids and my husband don't necessarily like it because i'm a very early riser and i get up early and i just air the house and sometimes even air their rooms when they're still in their beds and to get them out of bed but also just to bring fresh air in and then you know i um have crystals everywhere and i use um kind of really nice organic room sprays and all just to bring a fresh scent in and it feels like every day is a fresh day and you start fresh and that translates into my work into our relationships into hopefully the kids school work so i take this very literally yeah i agree it's such a important kind of you know setting the day out now i yes. i believe you started your career in journalism how did you move obviously it sounds like you were sort of surrounded by art as you were growing up but how did you move across to interiors and design Yes it was I started as a journalist so I actually started off before um even becoming a journalist I, I was a, um, a ballerina so I was doing quite well oh. in ballet, so ballet um and my parents always always told me have a plan b it's absolutely great to pursue your dream but have a plan b and I always liked magazines I liked fashion I liked journalism and so I thought like hmm, if I if it shouldn't work out I could become a journalist but I was on the path of um, becoming a ballerina that dream um <laughs> kind of was shattered when I um had a knee and hip injury. Injury and couldn't pursue dancing um but i was really grateful for having this plan b so i um was in germany first and i had a little stint in the us and did an internship at a magazine there and then came to london to study journalism yeah so i studied here in london did that did my ma in fashion journalism at the london college of fashion and then um went on to get quite a good role as um one of germany's biggest publishing houses the uk fashion and lifestyle editor so I was there for about 6 or 7 years um it was my dream job but i felt that i couldn't creatively fulfill myself the way i wanted 
to do it. And I also felt that me as an as an African woman in, you know, that kind of mainstream media, I felt, you know, there's not enough representation of a kind of African brand that I wanted to see. But I never I knew I would never branch into fashion, into fashion design or anything. Because that's just not it's just not how I expressed myself. And so um yeah, interiors was there and I loved interiors. And I always ask myself, why didn't I go into interior design? And you know, it went very quick. I had my first child um over 13 years ago and um launched the brand in my um maternity leave, not believing that it would ever be a full-time <laughs> business for me a brand i just thought like oh let's have a little side brand do something you know whilst you know your your um your journalism career and it took off and um i think it just grew from there and before we talk more about that i'd love to hear your um second secret which is around having gallery walls so interiors are really really important to me that the house is kind of in synergy with who i am and i have two gallery walls so we have a um two-story house basically um two floors um and there's a um on the staircase Okay, so the first floor, there's a gallery wall with all our loved ones, um, family members, parents, uh, siblings, um, and ourselves, the kids when they were little, you know, and it's just a really beautiful gallery wall because often most of the times I rush up and down without looking at it. But I think during lockdown specifically, I really took more time to look at that gallery wall and, and see everyone and bring back these memories. And I really try to, if I can, every morning when I walk you know, walk downstairs to make the kids breakfast to really look and just, you know, take a few seconds to see who's there and, you know, and, and experience that. And I think that makes a big change in how you approach, you know, everyday life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you also have a second one, which is of kind of more geared around inspiration. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. The um the second staircase which leads up to our loft um is full of inspiration. I have some really amazing photographs there from um um you know different photographers, um art pieces that I like. And um, you know, I love to hang fabrics, you know, I, I also collect kind of um African vintage um fabrics. So I've got some Kuba cloth, you know, um, and some some really beautiful kente cloth, um, all up there. So it's beautiful, and that really inspires me. And I think also for my, um, for my family. I mean, they're not necessarily <laughs> as much into textiles, but I think they they get a sense and understanding. And my parents did that. I think hopefully that my kids, as they grow older, they grow up with this, and they also see the value of it. Of course. And why why do you think color and pattern? is so transformative what is it do you think there's a special quality to the bright colors you use that energizes a room i i believe i'm a strong believer that color enhances everybody's life i really feel that um the whole white and gray color schemes even like you know if people dress fully in black it can look super chic and i sometimes dress in black and i I feel I don't actually don't feel that great, but I feel like it's nothing that enhances me. I think color is is a super easy way of enhancing people's lives, um, enhancing people's moods. And I think patterns, you know, it's a different step. I mean, I think I think for me the the, the foundation is color, and I think every home, in my opinion, should have a touch of color. And are there any colors that you are particularly drawn to? My favorite color combinations are dusky pinks with like a kind of a touch of copper and a really warm sage green. I love um, pinks and greens. Having said that, I haven't got a lot of pinks and greens in my home apart from accessories. Um, I like pinks and greens. I love really beautiful purples and lilacs. So my bedroom is is, is very different. It's, it's very, very plain, very, we've got a lot of white and gray, but the, the main color is like a really, really kind of a soft, lilac um i have purple accessories in there of course i say it's white and gray it's not it's purple and white and gray but um yeah i i like i like soft colors um and then also depends on where i am so um I'm, um, I'm working on a house in Greece, for example at the moment where there's a lot of blue and green around the surroundings so the in the inside of the house you wouldn't need as much color as you need here for example so i'm working with a, with a, with a kind of a softer color scheme out there but i think every house should have color every wardrobe should have color and life is more enjoyable now your your home life has a wonderful structure too which is your third secret tell us about your friday night party Yes. So we are um, also our house. I mean, we're very blessed to have the architect to create the most beautiful downstairs uh, open plan living room. We've got like a sunken area in there where we have basically the kitchen and the whole dining area in a sunken area. So we have um, stairs and on the um, downstairs open plan living room and it's the perfect space for entertaining. So 
pre-lockdown. Normally every Friday or every other Friday we have guests around, we entertain. I mean, it's either, I mean, friends or friends of our kids um, with their families. I mean, we have a big, big, big dining table. We can all sit and entertain. And it's just our, you know, kind of Friday night um, ritual. I like cooking, um, but my kids love cooking. My kids are literally, both of them are fantastic chefs. I mean, um, they're obsessed with master chef. They have a junior master chef, and they're really, they're really good. So uh, we cook as a family. We cook together. My husband chips in. Um, I think I'm a good cook, but I don't love it. But my, my kids absolutely love it. So we, um, you know, after lockdown, we couldn't do that anymore. So we decided to continue the tradition and do it as a family. So on um, Friday nights, my kids normally cook something amazing. Um, I dress up <laughs> because I don't have a lot of chances to dress up anymore. And um, we just have a really lovely Friday night dinner. And um, it's just, a, I think we're breaking away from the everyday lockdown, you know, like sitting there doing nothing and doing so it's something to look forward to for the whole family. We make it fantastic. We have nice drinks and, you know, you know, make kind of for the kids like kind of um, non-alcoholic kind of smoothies mocktails exactly and just enjoy ourselves with the family and hopefully once lockdown is over we can continue that tradition with with friends and family and everyone we haven't seen Ava you you're leaving us with such a wonderful visual of you know your your family and your your son at the meat station and your daughter making desserts and um, thank you for sharing all your stories you know we have the visual of you hanging out the duvets in the morning. We have the gallery wall. We have your color pattern and all your different influences from around the world. So I've loved speaking to you. Thank you very much for your time. My final guest on Bold, Bright and Beautiful is color curator Joa Studham. It's great to have you on the podcast, Joa. Great to be here, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. Now, um, let's start with how we always start. Tell us about your home. Well, my home is a, it's a perfectly formed tiny Victorian schoolhouse, but it's in the middle of rolling fields um, with only a church and a coach house as neighbours. Uh, the position is amazing. It's actually on the Hasbun Estate, um, which is now home to the famous Newt Hotel. Which I think oh, familiar. right. So yeah. That, that was a convenient job for me. <laughs> I don't think that when we came here, I'm not sure we thought much about the landscape. It was more about the house it, and the, the reason we bought the house was because it really reminded us of a house we had endlessly rented and, and parted in with friends when we were young and subsequently taken our children to so this house felt fantastically familiar it's almost as if it had ready-made memories um even though one is in Somerset and the other in Norfolk the architecture really attracted us because the schoolhouse is always have very high ceilings and my husband and children are very very tall so it felt like the house was made for us I know it sounds ridiculous but it, you know it really felt like it was inviting us in even though it's only got three minuscule bedrooms but the huge schoolroom has acres of wall hanging space which is really important to us. And how often do you redecorate it? The strangest thing is that actually we've only been here three years and Actually, it's, I'm not so obsessed with the interior, particularly here. It's very much about the exterior. So obsessed with the cows and the sheep and being close to nature feels more important than anything. And I think that's probably because we grew up, all grew up in London. Yeah. And what about the garden? Are you, are you interested in gardening? Well, I am now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we very much, all four of us, grew up in London, my husband and my children and me. Um, but... Indeed, through lockdown, our mantra has been to you know turn off the news and build a garden. Um, yeah, that's well. lovely. And actually, I think it's it's different when you build a house when your children are in their twenties, because we've done it together to suit their needs as much as ours. You know, it needs to be a party house for them and a sanctuary for us, and sometimes a party house for us actually. <laughs> and are you finding the the shift in pace quite different now you're in the countryside? Yes, it took some time to get used to, but um, I think it, we just appreciate everything more. And I know everybody bangs on about it, but just the fact that you know, one's reading the seasons. And um, for me, that's incredibly important because of light, um, the way the light is affected by the seasons. And just because I spend a huge amount of time outside. Yeah, that um, actually links us to your first secret, which is using light to guide you through the day. Well, what I mean by that is that 
I've spent all day, every day for the last 25 years, I guess it is, um, advising people on how to use colour in their homes. But somehow I feel that this house has advised me, you know, it's taught me yeah, so much. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. The, by, by nature of its architecture, you know, the, the huge schoolroom just had to be white. Um, mm. A concept that felt really alien to me. I bet. And I create. Yeah, no. So I had to create a white when I got here because it was just sort of bland uh, commercial paint, um, which the paint I've made is now Farnborough Schoolhouse White. Yeah. And I did that to emphasise the size and light of the room, but more importantly, to retain the spirit of the building that, that you know, was so important, that kind of iconic, simple feel. And because colour is my thing, I've never really lived in a white room. No, so I, I bet. Instinctively, <laughs> it was, it's strange. So I instinctively painted the little much darker bedrooms in colours that I felt to be right for each one, you know, like a green for the one going into the garden, a silvery skylight blue one for the one on the first floor in the tower, which has got windows on three sides. And for the intimate one in the middle, a uh, cocooning setting plaster, which always feels like it's giving you a hug. So usually I would be surrounded by colour at all times of the day. But now I progress from like the lightest colour in the big schoolroom, the schoolhouse white, where we spend all day, into the much stronger colours at night. And this mimics the natural rhythm of the light, which of has course. to be good for our well-being. You know, light yeah. should be our friend when it comes to decorating. And there's no doubt that living like this kind of enhances our lives because we're not fighting nature. I think it's interesting thinking about how our outlook on colour changes based on broader sort of context. And I think, you know, we've seen, and I'm sure you've also seen kind of a kind of renewed interest in earthier, more grounding colours um, over the kind of last few years. And I guess we're hoping that actually maybe bright colours will become more popular as we kind of come out of this time i think that even though it was you know pre the dreaded pandemic mm. we suddenly realized that we wanted um a little bit stronger colors in our homes we we were looking differently at the way we live we sort of crave colors which will enrich our homes and create kind of intimate sanctuaries rather than those you know the, the white and gray very flat very hard very unforgiving way we were living in, in the 10 years pre previously and I think the more time we've spent in our homes the more likely it is that we will embrace you know stronger colors brighter colors more folkloric kind of crafty colors um which again will nourish us is there somebody you know a particular person either today or from design history a kind of colorist whom you particularly admire or who's inspired you well I think <laughs> I always am inspired by the paintings of Rothko because I think yeah. that is the deft way that mm. colours are put together and they make us feel such different things in their different combinations. Do you have a family of colours that you're that you're drawn to when you decorate? I think that I, I change. I mean, to be honest, I do redecorate constantly. <laughs> I'm slightly embarrassed by it now. No. Um, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it it changes. I mean, even, you know, I'm affected by trends and just sort of what's going on in the world. Um, and, of course, by, by different buildings. I mean, you know, I hear the, you know, I have a very, very small dark hall, um, which was is where you come through the front door. And it was sort of screaming out to be green so that you kind of carry on the feeling of the kind of bucolic greens of the of the fields around it. And I wanted to create a bit of drama, but also it makes it means that when you go from that dark hall into the big white schoolroom, it that room feels even bigger and lighter in comparison. And that's so obvious, you know, it's sort of out of the darkness comes light. And you know, let's allow nature to teach us a better way to live. And and, and I think what colour is your hallway? It's a colour called Bancha. Bancha. Good. I just feel that that would be what everyone's asking whilst we listen. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love that colour because it is very connected to nature. And I think that's what's important. It's really great to celebrate the cyclical nature of the day, um, especially at the moment when we're stuck at home all day. So we can use colours, you know, to punctuate the end of the working day and the beginning of a relaxing, cosy evening. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. Now, your second secret is India and how it bombards your senses. Tell us about that. I feel sort of slightly embarrassed about this because it sounds so corny to say India. Not at all. And also, <laughs> um, it also is ridiculous when you're sitting in the middle of a field in Somerset. Um, <laughs> but, but there is no doubt that the huge amount of time I've spent in India has played some part in the way I decorate you know, and fill my house. And I don't mean it's full of Indian artefacts. In fact, I couldn't think of one apart from some giant plastic dolls I once bought at a car park in the middle of the night. Uh, that's another story. Uh, but, the, but it's the fact that India bombards your senses in every way. And similarly, there's nothing minimalist about us. You know, I love the chaos, the smells, the noise, and obviously the colours of India. But what I love most is when sometimes you get off the beaten track and you come across a sort of single figure, hopefully in a fabulously coloured turban, sitting stock still staring at some, you know, extraordinary view in total peace. And I hope my home's like that, you know, full of kind of fun and laughter and chaos and crazy cooking and game playing. But also it's a place where we should reach a level of total calm, some, some, somewhere other from the crazy world we live in. You know, I, I like to think that sometimes I arrive here and my shoulders just drop, you know, and I feel kind of incredibly relax and that's what well, that's what india does to me it kind of welcomes me back to create more cherished memories basically as somebody who obviously has been able to travel um and look you know for inspiration in um amazing other cultures and experiences where are you finding you're looking at the moment now we're all grounded <laughs> um well, well actually that's a really really interesting um topic because Less wide is the answer. Um, looking at things much more to do with the home, um, you know, in much smaller areas. So whether it be, you know, food, or it could be you know anything from sort of flour to vegetables, you know, all those things which are so familiar to us, but we don't really even think about them being colour. What what you know, everybody always says to me, oh, you know, are you inspired by the sky? And yes, of course. Of course, but actually there are things right under our noses, which are really, really inspirational. So tell us about your third secret, colour palettes and the use of colour. Obviously, we've talked a lot about colour already, but how this really is kind of one way that you elevate your everyday. Yeah, I mean, I think when I was just thinking about, you know, the things which are most precious to me, um, one of my most treasured possessions um, is still is a set of Caron Dash colouring pencils that my father brought me back from a business trip to Switzerland when I was about eight. Um, it wasn't the really huge one, which is what I really wanted. You know, they came in a sort of tin and some of them were massive. My one had about um, 20 colours. In fact, I know they had 22 colours. Um, but I loved it more than you could imagine. And the funny thing is, I didn't do anything as vulgar as actually use them. I just spent a ridiculous amount of time playing with them in the tin, um, rearranging the colours, Seeing what happened if I put the yellow so it sat with the blue to look like the sun in the sky. Um, well, yeah, I was only eight, but it really kind of fascinated me. And that's exactly what I'm still doing. But it's with the Farron Ball palette instead. Um, and there's nothing I love more than when it comes to having to change around the colour card when we've made new colours. And admittedly, there was 25 years hiatus between my eight year old self um, playing with them but uh, and, and working at Farron Ball. I feel incredibly lucky to still be employing my eight-year-old passions. Well, and I really how wonderful do feel is that? Special. Yeah. And my work life and home life are very, you know, they, they are entwined um, at all times. And I feel also incredibly lucky that because over the last 20 years, I've seen the growth of what's now the phenomenon of Farron Ball. Um, you know, it's turned into a kind of revered global brand. But what is so fantastic is it still has that amazing depth of colour, but now it's really eco-friendly. And, and the geniuses in the lab have made the paint totally life, um, totally wipeable. So, uh, you know, what could be better for our homes? Thank you for opening up your home. I have a lovely vision of you in Somerset in your stunning schoolhouse white sitting room, looking out <laughs> over the green rolling fields. Have you got good weather there today? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but um, we'll be out there. It's heaven because it's, 
you know, it's in the country, but we've got Bruton a mile away with full of it's all its extraordinary wonders. Yeah. Do you have a secret local address that you love in Bruton? Or is oh, it well, the bar at the Newt? Everybody loves the chapel. That, that, yeah. that, that's um, everybody's meeting ground. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Joa. I've loved speaking to you. It's been wonderful. And I you know, feel very uplifted and want to fill my life with colour. So thank you very much. That is everything from Bold, Bright and Beautiful. This week's episode of The Well-Crafted Life, a future homes production from Homes and Gardens and Martin Moore. I'm Sarah Spiteri, and my editor is Matt Gibbs. We do hope that you'll join us again next week. Thank you.